Well, good morning. I better start this so Roger, Roger doesn't tell me it wasn't working. That happens sometimes. All right, as of this minute, Roger, the clicker works. I don't guarantee it still will when you get back up here. But. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to services at the 6th and Washington Streets Church of Christ. If you're visiting with us, thank you for joining us this morning. We hope you'll stop back every opportunity you have with, to worship with us and, and can you continue in our growth in our service to God. If you are visiting, we'd ask that you'd please uh, complete one of the attendance cards. You'll find those in the back of the pew in front of you. And you can place those in the collection baskets uh, as we exit this morning. Those who will be taking a public part this morning, uh, Tim Wells will be leading our singing. Dave Potts will have our opening prayer. Colt Nettie will have our scripture reading. John Dollison will lead our minds at the Lord's table. And Roger will be speaking to us this morning. And his lesson is titled, A Lesson on Hope. So we'll let Tim get things started. First song will be number 646, 646. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast told me to say, it is well, it is well with my Our minds for the Lord's Supper will sing number 178. 178.
should see one of these on the uh, pew in front of you. If you're not familiar with what, uh, what this is about, the way we do it now, we have a little cellophane on top, and you peel that back, and the, the bread will be there. And then when you get to the fruit of the vine, you peel back the aluminum, and you'll find that there. So, uh, do you ever think about the, the courage it took for Jesus to go through what he went through? Uh, he, he had to know what was coming. He knew he, he was going to feel every nail, feel every insult. Feel every every blow, every um, lash, uh, and yet he still did it. He, he made up his mind. He was going to go through it and control himself. I mean, he could have could have destroyed all those enemies. He could have killed everyone and walked off that cross. But there was a plan. There was a a goal, and he made up his mind he was going to do it, and he did it. I think it's a great lesson for us to, to keep in mind that every day we have challenges, we have things that just want to distract us from, from uh, serving God and, and, and getting to heaven. And we just need to do like Jesus did, which is focus on the end goal. Remember that you know, all this stuff going on here is relatively unimportant compared to, to spending our eternity with him in heaven. So, uh, if you would uh, bow with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, we thank you for the example that Jesus gave us, that we can follow him and, and see ourselves through every challenge that we're faced with here on the earth. And please help us to always keep him in our mind and uh, rise to the occasion like he did and, and put you first. And we thank you for, for his example and, and your willingness to, to still uh, accept us into heaven thanks to his sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the fruit of the vine represents Jesus' blood, and the, the uh, unleavened bread obviously uh, uh, represents Jesus' body that was sacrificed on the cross. And the bread, uh, the blood, is, is emblematic of, of the fact that, that God will continue to, to watch over us and, and forgive us of our sins as we go forward, or, uh, as as we have to make them. Obviously, it's best to try not to do it. We don't have a uh, ability to just get away with it, but, you know, he's, we, we don't have to live a perfect life. We can, we, we have Jesus' blood to wash over us as we go forward, and um, it's a, certainly a, a wonderful blessing to know that we don't have to be perfect, but we can certainly strive to be the example that Jesus showed for us. So, uh, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, we thank you that you continue to watch over us and guide us and that the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross was for our sins today as they were for everybody since 2,000 years ago. And we ask that you watch over us and help us to avoid sins going forward and uh, in our daily lives, keep our focus on you and follow the example that Jesus set so that one day we can spend eternity with you in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as part of our COVID procedure, we don't pass the baskets anymore, but we do have them in the, on a couple tables in the back, and uh, if you're so inclined, you can leave a contribution there on your way in or out, and uh, we'll try to make the most of it. We support a lot of uh, ministries around the world and around our community, and, and uh, of course, we need the money to keep the lights on and uh, do the work we do here locally, so through your, uh, your generosity that we're able to do that, and uh, we certainly appreciate that. Uh, bow with me, please. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, we thank you for the blessings we have in this life, for the health and prosperity we enjoy, and we ask that you guide us and help us to make the most of these opportunities and these blessings so that you'll be proud of us and we can make uh, good things happen with all the blessings you've given us and uh, help us find our way home to your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Number 541, 541. Soft as the voice of an angel, breathing a lesson unheard. Hope with a gentle persuasion, whispers a comforting word. Wait till the darkness is over. Wait till the tempest is done. Hope. For the sunshine tomorrow, after the shower is gone. Whispering hope, oh, I welcome my voice, making my heart in its song. Deepening darkness, bright in the glimmering star. Then, when the night is upon us, why should the heart sink away? When the dark midnight is over, what for the breaking of? Whispering hope, oh, I welcome my voice, making my heart in its sorrow rejoice. Hope as an anchor so steadfast, with the dark veil for the soul, whether the master has entered, robbing the grave of his gold. Come, then oh come, that fruition, come to my sad weary heart. Come, oh the blessed hope of glory. Psalm before the prayer scripture reading and lesson will be number 311, 311. If you're able to, please stand. Mm-hmm. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I did not trust the sweetest frame, but only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In 
every high and stormy my ankles within the veil on Christ the soul all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand is of this common and his blood support me in the whelming flood when all around my soul gives way he then is all my hope and say on Christ's all and rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand when he shall come with trumpet sound oh, may I then in him be found rest in his righteousness alone but less to stand before the throne on Christ's all and rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand song following the last one will be number 562 562 Let us bow our heads in prayer. Oh, gracious Father, we're so thankful to come here today to worship you in spirit and truth, to come before you in prayer, to sing songs of praise, and to hear a portion of thy word. We're so thankful, Father, for all the blessings you have given us and for all of our families and our loved ones. Father, we ask that you be with the world leaders as chaos is occurred in different parts of the world, that they may find and seek peace and comfort within those around them and, and those that they're in charge of. Father, we also pray for the natural disasters that are going out throughout the world that are causing problems for infrastructures, whether it be earthquakes or, or whether it be hot, high floods or any of those things that as people go to try to get back to a sense of normalcy, that they may look up to you, Father, knowing that through you all things can be accomplished. For those who look up to you, Father, help them to, to see, and maybe they'll be added to the church as well. Father, we also pray for our leaders here in this country, that they look for the good of the people rather than for things and, and the ways of the world that they'll do things in a peaceful and orderly manner to bring us all together so we can live in peace and seek you, Father, in everything that we're doing. We pray for the church here, Father, for, for the members here, for all of us that's been added to the church, that we continue to come here and worship you in spirit and truth, that we understand that we have a message that we have to take out throughout the world, Father, and that we know what that message is, and that we can do that effectively. We also pray for the mission that we have here as a, as a Six and Washington congregation, that we can work together to push that, message, that, that mission out to preach Christ and to teach Christ so people will understand that there is a better way and better than this, that we can actually get to heaven and see you, but only through him. We ask, Father, that when we have our shortcomings, that you, you forgive us for those things, that, that we can really reflect on you of how we ought to be to live our life as Christians so others will understand that why, are, why we're happy and what, are, what makes us joyful, but also where we have the fear of you, Father, and what you can do to us, for you're the creator of all, creator of us, and you can do anything you want to us anytime. Let us know that and understand that, Father. Father, that we're so thankful for our leadership here, our elders, our deacons, and everyone else, the body here, that you be with them and help them make the right decisions as time progresses. 
And Father, we're so thankful for our, our speaker, the messengers here that preach in spirit and truth, who uplift us so whenever we do leave here, this place of worship, knowing that the, the world is out there and it's ready to devour us, that we may see who they are, that we may see the good in those, and that we may be able to, to whenever sin comes our way, that we were able to reflect from it. Lord, we pray for our sick father within the congregation. People have different ailments. Please uh, be with them and, and, and help them through their pain or misery that they may have through prayer and people praying that for their health and, and welfare, knowing that time will be short here on life and eternal is forever, that that's what they look for. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning's scripture reading comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 24 through 39. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows that knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and those whom he predestined he also called and those whom he called he also justified to those whom he justified he also glorified what then shall we say to these things if god is for us who can be against us he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who is raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? It is as it is written, For your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I know we have several out of town this week vacationing. And I might mention that Diane and I will be away next Sunday as well. The uh, time for vacations is rapidly drawing to a close. School is underway, and we're looking forward to uh, everyone being at home before long and uh, perhaps seeing our attendance increase a little. But as I tell you repeatedly, we're not focused on numbers. We're focused on souls. Our goal is to help as many people as possible live an abundant life here knowing that uh, eternity with God awaits them hereafter. That is our hope in Christ, and our prayer is that you share that hope with us. Visiting today, Penny has her nephew. I guess that means Kelly has her cousin from Austin. Nice to have you here. And he's a fireman in Austin, 
and plans to reti retire before too much longer. I didn't ask how much longer, but let's encourage him to move back to Marietta and get away from all that heat out there in Austin. It's a nice place to visit, but way too hot for me to live. And uh, we're happy to have him visiting with us. Traven and Maggie are back uh, this morning. Is there a holiday I missed? Is somebody's birthday, anniversary, uh, one of the dogs celebrating? I, there's got to be a reason, doesn't there? They surely wouldn't come home just to see Kurt and Donetta. Probably they came to see Abby. But we're glad to see them. If you are visiting and I haven't noticed you, my apologies. Uh, we do appreciate those who visit with us and hope that you'll always want to return uh, having been a part of our assemblies. Appreciate, Tim, all of the emphasis in our singing on hope this morning. What is hope? The word in the New Testament is el pis, sometimes el pidos, depending on the declension. We generally think of hope as a wish, a strong desire. We talk about uh, children hoping to get certain things for their birthday or for some other holiday. That, I'm happy to tell you, is not what the scriptures are contemplating when they speak of our hope in Christ, as Romans chapter 8 clearly does. Nor is it what was in the mind of the writer of the Hebrews epistle in chapter 6 when he spoke of our anchor of hope in Jesus Christ. The word literally means, and I want you to hear this, joyful and confident expectation of good things to come. I believe as people of God we bring to life every day an attitude that the world doesn't understand because it doesn't share our hope. I really believe for people of God, based what I read in, on what I read in the Bible, that things generally work out. Maybe not always the way we want them to work out, but always in the way that is in the best interest of God's people. And in this text in Romans 8, there's that marvelous affirmation of God's providence at work in the lives of Christians. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And it doesn't say there or anywhere in the Bible that if you follow God, that everything in life will be rosy, that life will be easy, that the problems will fade. What the Bible tells us is that when we face those problems, we will not face them alone. One of my favorite stories in the Old Testament is in 2 Kings chapter 6. It is a story about the prophet Elisha and his interaction with Israel's enemy, Syria. It seems that the king of Syria repeatedly plans to destroy the people of God, but always fails because somehow Israel knows where the Syrian army is going to be. The problem is so bad that in, first, or in 2 Kings 6, this is the exchange between the king of Syria and his servants. Will you not show me who of us is for the king of Israel? We've got a spy in our midst. I want to know who he is. So he turns to all of his advisors and counselors and says, I want him identified. Here is the response. And one of the servants said, None, my lord, O king. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. In other words, this prophet of God knows everything about you. You have no secrets, and he's informing the nation of Israel. Well, what should the king of Syria do in such a situation? He will find Elisha. Where is he? Elisha is located, and the remainder of the text, or most of it, then tells us that the army of Syria surrounds Elisha. And Elisha's servant is beside himself. When he looks out and everywhere he looks, he sees the enemy. Here's the prophet's response to his servant. Do not be afraid. Well, I think that's a message that ought to resonate with people of God 
every day. In Christ, we have no real reason to fear. We have that kind of hope that God is in charge, and for us, whatever happens, it will be well with our souls. But this servant doesn't see the big picture. All he sees is an army surrounding him, knowing full well that that army is after his master, Elisha, and if Elisha goes, so he will go as well. He thinks death is imminent. But again, the prophet says, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And I can just see the, the servant scratching his head and thinking, What in the world are you talking about? There's this vast army. We're surrounded. There's nowhere we can go. Then Elisha prayed and said, O oh Lord, please. Open his eyes that he may see. Maybe, just maybe, that should be our prayer as well. Lord, open our eyes so we can see who really is in charge. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And when the Syrians came down against him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Please strike this people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness in accordance with the prayer of Elisha. And Elisha said to them, This is not the way, and this is not the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. And he led them to Samaria, the capital of the nation of Israel. I wonder if we really had our eyes open, if we could see God at work in our world right now, just as he worked in the world of Elisha. After all, he is the same God. He loves us with the same intensity, And his power is limitless. So that, as people of God, no matter what is happening around us, there really is no reason for despair. Don't give up. We have an anchor that is both sure and steadfast. A knowledge that God is in charge. And whatever happens out here in this world, in Christ, we're going to be just fine. Does that mean we're all going to live to an old age and die of natural causes and easy death? Not at all. In fact, you know if you study the New Testament that Jesus repeatedly told his disciples that there was a cost that comes with discipleship. There's a price to be paid. And sometimes it's pretty steep, but it is insignificant and minuscule compared to the rewards both now and eternally that belong to Christians. And I see that in this powerful passage in, in Romans chapter 8. For the entire summer, we have been studying Paul's letter to the church at Rome, and God willing, next Sunday morning, Tim is going to conclude that study with chapters 15 and 16. And I will tell you, I've not been able to be here for every one of them, but every one that I've had the opportunity to sit in on has just been outstanding. And one of the things that has impressed me immensely is the preparation that every one of those teachers made in order to present the chapter or chapters that uh, they had been assigned. And if you missed out on that study, you missed out. And I would hope that you will be here next Sunday morning, God willing, at 9 o'clock to hear what Tim has to share from the 15th and 16th chapters. I'll also pause just a moment and tell you that two weeks from today at 9 a.m., God willing, we'll begin a study of the epistle of James. 
it's one of the most practical letters in the New Testament. And you will find in those five chapters things that will help you every day be the person God calls you to be. Why would you not want to be present for a study of such a powerful letter? I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer for a lot of things, but I know there's one out there. I hope it's not indifference, lukewarmness, a laissez-faire attitude toward the church and scripture. But if it is, I'd like to build a fire under you and get you to move in the right direction to want to know God's word better, that you might live more closely in the steps of Jesus. And I understand that two hours for some of you is a long time. I'm not talking about those of you that find it difficult to be seated in this auditorium for two hours. I'm talking about those of you that just think you've got better things to do. You don't. And your soul is at stake. If you want to have the hope that Christians have in Christ, you've got to have the commitment to follow through, to really be engaged. And understand when I say that, that I don't believe that our time in this assembly is the essence of what it means to be a child of God. Take what you learn from God's Word and let it guide your steps through the rest of the week so that when others see you, they will see a reflection of him. In the text that Colton read a moment ago, I want to focus primarily on the last paragraph of the 8th chapter. And I especially want to highlight uh, the word ooh. Ooh. Sometimes we talk about what when the emphasis always ought to be on who or whom. The Apostle Paul in his letter to the church at Corinth said in verses 27 and 28, whom we preach. Well, whom did Paul preach? Jesus Christ. He said, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus is Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake, 2 Corinthians 4, 5 whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man that we might present every man perfect or complete in Christ. My job is not to make you feel good. It's not simply to lift your spirits, although I think a hope-filled message ought to do that. My responsibility is to take you to God's Word where you will find, as all of us should find, direction for the road ahead. And in front leading the way must always be. Jesus. So let's just look at this text this morning. The passage says, what then shall we say to these things, all of these things that Paul has written thus far through the 8th chapter, including this great emphasis on the hope we have in Christ and the providence of God at work in our lives. What shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? In essence, God's power is our protection. Just as God protected Elisha, God continues to protect his people. It doesn't mean that there will not be heartache and misery, as we've said already, but that we will never face those difficulties alone. Here quickly are some passages to consider. These are the words of Moses to Israel in behalf of God in Leviticus 26, 7 and 8. And you shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. And five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. Now, what is he saying? He's saying when you stand with God, you become an invincible force. Israel's army was not the best equipped, the best trained, but it was the most powerful force on the field of battle because God fought with them and beside them. 
when Joshua, who led the conquest, was about to wrap things up for Israel in chapter 23 of the book that bears his name, verse 10, he says, One of you shall chase a thousand, for the Lord your God, he it is that fighteth for you, and he hath promised you. I wonder if we find similar promises elsewhere. I've mentioned to you many times the words of Jonathan, the son of Saul, as he is in his armor bearer are about to engage the Philistines, a garrison of them, just two men. Jonathan turns to his armor bearer and says, 1 Samuel 14, 6, I'm persuaded with the Lord there's no restraint to say by many or by few. Let us arise and enter into the garrison of the Philistines. And the two of them whipped the garrison and their example motivated the entire army to stand and fight. And they did not stand and fight alone. For God had promised to be with them. The psalmist wrote in the 118th Psalm, the 6th verse, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. Let me ask you to do something. Whether you do it or not is up to you, but consider this. In the next day or two, get out your concordance and look at every example in God's book where God says, don't be afraid. You may be shocked to find how many times that message resonates from his book. Take it to heart. In Hebrews 13, verse 6, the writer, I don't know who wrote Hebrews, but he was inspired, says, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man may do unto me. You see, if you're on God's side because God's always on your side. You have no reason to fear. God's power protects. So Paul instructed Timothy, 1 Timothy 4, 7, or 1 Timothy 1, 7, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. That's our hope. I don't know what this world holds. I don't have any idea what the future entails, but I know in Christ it will be well with our soul. God has promised to his people that when he is for us, no one can stand against us. Who can, the text continues, bring a charge against any? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Not only is God's power there to protect, God's Son is actively engaged in maintaining our welfare. His law provides our sanctuary. In the class on Romans this morning, in chapters 13 and 14, Darrell specifically pointed out what Paul has said about Christians and the law. He says, you have no reason to fear as long as you do what the law demands. The fear arises when you ignore the law. And what Paul is saying to Christians is very simply the same thing. You abide in God's law, it will be your sanctuary. No one can honestly bring an accusation against you. No charge was ever leveled toward Jesus that stood. John 18, 38, 19, 4, and 6, Pilate is compelled to say, having examined the evidence three times and reached the same conclusion each time, I find no fault in this just person. How could that be? Because Jesus lived by the principles of God's holy book. And as God's only begotten Son, he did no sin, and guile was not found in his mouth. Do you know that when you read Acts carefully, 
that every time Paul stands before the judge, be it Felix, Festus, Agrippa, or ultimately the emperor himself, no one is able to level an accusation that can stand. They say he has done nothing worthy of death or even incarceration. No charge can stick against people of God who take sanctuary in the word of God. 1 Peter 3.16, Peter says, Having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation conduct in Christ. You commit yourself to be guided by God's word, and no honest charge will be leveled against you. Oh, there will be charges, as there were against both Jesus and Paul, but they won't stand up because you find your sanctuary in God's holy word. That's our hope. And then the text continues, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or nakedness? But prior to that, he, he raised the question, Who's to condemn you? God's grace makes our salvation possible. We are flawed people. You may have, if you were listening carefully to John this morning at the Lord's table, you would have heard him remind all of us that we're not perfect people. And God understands that we're imperfect. He does not demand perfection. What he demands, folks, is faithfulness. And why is that? Because he is a gracious God who is on our side. He's pulling for us. In a couple of weeks or so, we're going to be looking at a passage in Hebrews that talks about the Christian life as a race and how we're surrounded by those who are pulling for us to be victors. And this great host that's in our camp on our side include God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And all of the redeemed that have going on, going on before, they are in our corner. And when God is in our corner, we stand uncondemned because His grace through the blood of Jesus, His Son, can continues to provide the cleansing that all of us desperately need, as promised in 1 John 1, verse 7. No one can point the accusing finger and substantiate the charges when we live our lives as people of God. That is our hope. Will charges be leveled? Absolutely. But if you are a child of God, faithfully walking in the steps of of the master the charges won't stick and God's grace assures our salvation Jesus is the judge and he will not condemn his faithful disciples in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 9 through 11 Paul wrote about the characteristics of many who composed the church in that city when the letter was written. And if you read the text, there's a list of sins. We might consider them among the worst of sins. But his response was, you're washed, you're justified, you're forgiven, you're saved. How is this possible? Because the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that the denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we, we were Christians, should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Titus 2, 11 and 12. Do we deserve to be washed, sanctified, justified, cleansed, and forgiven? No. If it were based on our personal merit, we would have no hope. 
but it's based on the wonderful sacrifice of Jesus. Who, because he had no sin, could give his life for ours. Our sins, our transgressions, our failings. Long ago, Isaiah had written about the nature of sin. We can be stained and scarred and black. and Then Jesus comes along. And through his blood, he can make us as white as the new fallen snow. Do we deserve it? No. Can we earn it or achieve it? Absolutely not. But by his grace, we can be saved and no one can condemn us. That's our hope in Christ. As a Christian, if you are striving every day to be the person God calls you to be, you don't have to face the day in fear. Will you sometimes fail? We all do. Will you transgress God's commands? Yes, we all do. But God understands. Jesus is gracious and forgiving. I'm not talking about willful, intentional violations, but the kinds of things that happen in moments of weakness, when we're under great pressure, when we're not feeling well, when we're surrounded by people who are pulling and tugging us in the wrong direction. It's easy to get caught up in that. But the promise is God understands and will forgive. But if we sin willfully, after that we receive the knowledge of the truth. Hebrews 10, 26 says, in essence, all bets are off. It's a different story. But if you are, a, as a faithful child of God, living every day for Christ, you have nothing to fear. What a wonderful hope that is. I don't, as I said, know what tomorrow holds. But I know who does. And if he holds us in his hands, it will be well with our souls. The text continues, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then he gives a, a series of questions about this, not necessarily in question form. He just says, shall tribulation, shall distress, shall persecution, famine, nakedness, uh, abstract poverty, abject poverty. Danger or sword? And the answer is no. Nothing can separate us from God's love. It is our bond. Any parent, I think, can appreciate what Paul is saying here. I have, I am sure, said too many times to count that I know that it's possible for my children and my grandchildren to disappoint me, maybe even break my heart. I don't expect that to happen, but I'm realistic enough to know that it can happen to anyone. But what I know in my heart of hearts is this, I will never stop loving them, wanting their best and working toward that end no matter what. And Paul says this is the way it is with our God. This is our hope. No matter how far we fall, how dark it gets, how bleak the picture, how black our soul may be stained by sin, there is hope in Christ for God still loves us and will accept us again if we will turn to him once more. A powerful message do you share in that hope? Nothing can stand between you and your God. You know that and you face the day with confidence. You'll have a smile on your face. You really will. And there will be a song in your heart because you have the hope that is found nowhere else but in Christ. I want to close with something I'm sure you've heard before and I don't really know who wrote it, but I, I heard it probably 50-some years ago, and it's stuck with me ever since. The stars shine over the mountains. The stars shine over the sea. 
The stars look up to a mighty God. The stars look down on men. The stars may shine for a million years, a million years in a day. But my God and I will live in love when the stars are passed away. Don't be so focused on this brief life, folks. Focus on the eternity that awaits us in Christ. And know that our hope is steadfast and sure. And no one and nothing can keep us from that eternal city someday if we continue to walk in the steps of Jesus. If you're doing that, and so many of you are, please continue. Don't ever give up. No matter what the devil throws your way, with God's help, you can withstand. Maybe you don't have that hope this morning. You may, but not on your terms, always on his terms. And we close nearly every one of our messages with a reminder of what he demands. Uh, implicit faith in the reality of God, the inspiration of the word of God, the deity of Jesus Christ. Now that kind of faith, it is designed to produce repentance, confession, and immersion, whereupon the blood of Christ cleanses your soul of sin. He adds you to his church. He writes your name in the Lamb's book of life, and you walk out of here with a, with a hope that no one and nothing can destroy. Don't you want that? It's yours if you come to him on his terms as we stand and sing. for me to lay and a saving for you. Lift up your voice, live within your care, and make it life anew. Kneel at the cross, please, every care. Kneel at the cross, Closing song will be number 16. I want to thank Roger for an excellent lesson and Daryl for an excellent lesson this morning in Bible class. Several announcements to share with you. Donna Mosley has been transferred from Memorial to, to Selby to uh, undergo her rehab. And she's told Roger she's doing very well, progressing well. Kay Casto was in the hospital and is now at Harmer Place. Reminder, our ladies' tea and friends and family day is coming up. Sign-up sheets and flyers are available in the lobby for our annual ladies' tea, as well as the friends and family day potluck 
That will be the weekend of September 18th and 19th. Following our final song, uh, Daryl will pull double duty this, duty this morning and have our closing prayer. Invite you back every opportunity you have to be with us this evening at 5. So we'll gather together again. Roger will be speaking to us on the topic of wise or foolish. And if you'd like to read ahead, uh, he'll draw that lesson from Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 29. Wednesday evening, we will continue our uh, summer series. It will actually be the, the last one of the summer series. Uh, we're looking forward to Bishop Darby being with us, and he'll be speaking on Christ's second coming. And of course, next, next uh, Sunday, 9 a.m. for Bible study. I uh, spoke that Tim will be wrapping up our study of the Book of Romans, and of course, 10 o'clock for worship. That's everything I have, so we will let Tim resume service now. Number 16, 1 6, if you're able to please stand. God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never. with me, please. Through the word at the end of the service, we thank you for allowing us all to make it out safely this morning and hear a lesson from your word, and we ask that we do our best to, as we always do, take this lesson and apply it to our everyday walk of life so that we can serve you better. We ask that you please go with us as we go our separate ways this morning. Please help us to make it home safely, be with all the visitors, and help them to make it back to their to their homes safely as well. We thank you for everything that you bless us with, and most of all, highest on that list, dear Lord, is your son Jesus, his willingness to come to this earth, suffer and die that cruel death on the cross, so that we may have that hope that we learned of this morning of home in heaven with you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. <laughs> 